chapter 1. I want to read just a, a portion of Scripture here. Paul is dealing with a divided body of Christ here. How many of you know that any house that's divided cannot stand? And Paul is dealing with this. There was jealousy in the body of Christ. There was one saying, well, I'm doing it this way. And the other was saying, well, I'm doing it that way. And, and Paul's dealing with this because he, he comes down in the Scripture of, of chapter 1 and, and verse number 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of clothes, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any of you should say that I have baptized you in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel... Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Amen. Now I want to talk about that just a little bit tonight. You know, the Bible tells us in John 3.16 that for God so loved the world... That He sent His only begotten Son. That whosoever should believe on Him should not perish, but should have eternal life. God so loved the world. God loves you and I. The Bible says that God is love. The Bible says that if you cannot love your brother that you can see, how can you love God that you cannot see? You see, the love of God is something that is complete. The love of God is, is something that is wholesome. The, the love of God is something that, that you and I just don't even begin to fathom to understand how much the Lord Jesus Christ loves you and I. I've told you over and over that while I have learned how much that I am loved, it makes me a different person. When I, You know, everybody is different if they know that they're loved. To know that you're loved. There, it makes a difference if people that think that they don't have anything, people that don't think they have a friend, people that don't think they, they have any support. It makes a difference when someone comes along and tells that person or tells you that they love you. It does something on the inside of you. It, it fills part of a void in you to, to let you know that, that there's somebody out there that cares for you. There's somebody out there that, that has favor for you. There's somebody out there that loves you. That God kind of love that says, I love you. Not, not because of something you can do for me. Not because of, of who you are. But I love you because the love of Christ is in me. And the Bible says, well, he was asking where, how will men know that you're my disciples because you love one another. Right. You see, the Bible says that perfect love yes. casts out all fear. That's how come that when you and I can perfectly love, when you and I have that, that burden of love inside of our heart, that, that we can look at a person, we can take hold of them, and, and we can pray with that without fear. We can pray believing God. We can, we can pray hanging on to the, the cross of Calvary, and, and the gift of faith begins to operate in our life, and, and we begin to see God move not only in our life, but in their life as God begins to change them through knowing that they are loved. You see, the love of God can change a person. When you know that you're loved, it changes you on the inside. It does something to you. I, I told all of you a lot of times that I've learned to get up every morning. And I don't say this in a bragging way. Well, maybe I do. But I've learned to open my eyes no matter how I feel because you cannot judge your Christianity. You cannot judge your relationship with Jesus Christ on how good or how bad you feel. Come on. I may not wake
wake up in the morning and feel that great and think that God is way out there somewhere. But have, what I have to realize is His Word is true. His Word is set on the foundation of Calvary. And God loves me. So I wake up in the morning and I open my eyes and I say, God, the one you love is awake and ready for the day. Amen! Because I've, under, I've come to understand that when He died on that cross for me, He gave me everything that pertains to life and godliness. He gave it to me. I'm an heir. I'm a joint heir. Lord, I'm in the will. Hallelujah! I mean, some of you get excited because some of your relatives die. You think that, that you're in the will and then that comes will reading day and you're not there. <laughs> But I can promise you that you are in His will. My. If you know Him, if you've been born again, if Jesus Christ has come into your life and He's saved your soul and stirred your heart and renewed you and redeemed you and, and regenerated you. Yes, you know, I told a lot of you that you got bad genes until you're born again. And then you get regenerated. Amen. Amen. That might be a little Bruce theology there. But the, the, analogy, the analogy fits. Because something happens, the love of God comes inside of you. And one of the problems with the church today, one of the reasons why people fail God so much is that they don't realize how much He loves you. And it's God's will to bless you. Some of you think, well, you know, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I've got to jump through this hoop and, and I've got to somehow or another come to this level in my faith. Can I tell you that when you woke up this morning, that if you knew Jesus Christ, He wants to bless your life. And if you come to the foot of the cross and surrender your life yeah. and say, Lord, I submit to your will, God says, I'm going to pour yeah. a blessing out on you. He'll bless you. I am telling you, there is a blessing at the foot of the old rugged cross. I'll preach it till the day I kick over. Yes. Amen. Because I've learned the secret yes. of Christianity. Yes. I've learned the secret of the Bible, which is really no secret at all. Yes. All you got to do is read the pages. I learned that when he stretched his arms out on that wooden beam and he died for me there and he was buried and he rose again from the dead, I that same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah. That same resurrection power lives inside of me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, you don't act excited about that. <laughs> Let me read that another way. That same resurrection power yeah. that raised Jesus from the dead. If you know Him, He lives in you. Yeah. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. Right. Yeah. Well, now you act a little bit happy. Let that sink into you. Come on. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God loves you. Yes, He does. That's why He sent His Son. That's right. That's why He took the wisdom of this world yes. and confounded the wise. See, I want to tell you something. The cross was a means of torture. It was a death instrument. How in the mind of man could you ever fathom that a cursed individual could die for your redemption? You see, the devil thought he had it. The devil thought this was it. But see, God had something else in the plan because in, in Jesus was perfect life. In Him was resurrection power. That was God Himself that was being crucified yeah. for you, for me. On that cross. That was God's plan. You see, to the to the devil it said, Ha ha, I got it. To the world it said, Hey, how could anybody be saved looking on him? But there was a thief. There was two thieves, actually. There was probably a lot more of them. But the Bible tells us about two. There was one who was on one side of him that railed against him. And the other one who looked on him and said, Hey, why don't you shut up over there? This man hasn't done anything. This is an innocent man. And he said, Lord. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Well, hey, faith was at work because God looks around. God, that's right, Jesus, God, looked around and said, Hey, today you will be with me in paradise. Right. You see, it was that saving kind of faith that that man said, Hey, you know what? That man is innocent. But I believe on him because there's something different about him. There's something different about this man. You know what? You look at Jesus when he went over there to pray for the madman of Gadara. The Bible says that this man, that he lived among the tombs, 
and that he would come out and that he would he would literally scare people. He, he was in the, the tombs night and day, cutting himself with rocks. Uh, the Bible says that many times he had been uh, uh, he had been chained up, he had been bound, and he had he plucked them to asunder. He was a he was a, a demon possessed man. There was something inside of this man that he knew that tortured him, that tormented him. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of people in this world that's out here today, and they're trying to find something in their life. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that's dabbing, dabbling with spiritual things that harms them. There's a lot of people that have opened up doors. I'm not talking about Christians being demon possessed, although you can be oppressed. Yeah. But I'm talking about there are people who have opened up doors to allow Satan to walk in and to control and take over their life. And let me tell you, when something like that happens, they know that something is not right on the inside. Yeah. They know there's something missing. Listen, God created you in, in, in His image and His likeness. There is something on the inside of each and every man, boy, and girl that says that there's something missing. When that takes place in their life. But the Bible says that Jesus got in the boat and He went over there to where that man was at. I believe that when that boat swam ashore, that that man man looked out there and he thought, oh, there's another one. And he went running out that way. But something happened in the middle of that little job. He went out there. Something on the inside of that man told him, hey, there is something different. Because the Bible says that that man fell at his feet and he worshipped him. Now I want to tell you something. There, a little side note here. There's a little danger in reading some of these other Bibles. Because you'll read a lot of these other versions of the Bible where it says that people just came and knelt at the foot of Jesus. And I want to tell you something. There's a big difference in coming and kneeling and coming and worshiping. Yeah. A big difference. I can get down on my knees and not do anything but go to sleep. There's a big difference in, in worship. And a big difference in just kneeling and falling down before somebody. The lepers over there, and it talks about how that they came and they, they knelt and they worshipped Him. I want to tell you something. There was something inside of that man that saw that there was something different about him. I believe the Holy Ghost, I believe the Holy Spirit worked and touched that man to realize that there is something there that is your answer. I believe that. I believe the Holy Spirit draws us to God. I believe the Holy Spirit works inside of our heart and, and convicts us of our sin. Let me tell you something. God hates sin. Yes, he does. Big ones, little ones, black, white ones, you name it. God hates sin. Right. But I want to tell you something. God loves every sinner. Yes. God loves. That's why 